Today we're going to look in on the European Nightcrawlers and I'm going to share some pro tips with you on how I manage the moisture, the bugs, and the population of these bins. Last time we noted that there was a lot more moisture in this bin than there was in the brand new bin. And then we also noticed there was different bugs and then obviously different populations because one is new and one is very old. So I'm just gonna kind of run through everything while I'm working today, talking about the moisture of bins and why it may or may not be different. And then also bugs, why you see them sometimes and sometimes you don't. And then also population. That's a popular question that I get about how do I expand my population? How do I get bigger worms? And also, you know, what happens when you have a bunch of them that die? All right, let's get set up and have a look at this bin, which is the older of the two European Nightcrawler bins. Okay, so if you were here last time, you did, you were here with me where this particular bin is still very, very wet. It doesn't have any kind of cover on it. It doesn't have anything on it. It's just uh, open to the atmosphere here. It's about 75% humidity down here and about 80 degrees Fahrenheit, and yet, this bin is absolutely 100% holding on to its moisture without a lid, without any kind of covering like a burlap uh, blanket or any kind of a plastic sheet like I use on blue. So why is that? This bin and the other bin are in the exact same room, same environment. The only thing that is different is the age of the bin and what percentage of the castings are completely finished. So that will bring me to one of my points about moisture is that how I control moisture in my bin is generally through the use of dry bedding or moist bedding and then dry food and moist food. And a lot of people are like, oh, you don't have any drain holes in these bins. I don't. Anytime that I have a super wet feeding, I'm going to give them a lot of dry bedding. And if I have kind of a dry feeding, I can either give them some of my prepared bedding that is already wet, or I can add water to the bin to make it even. I try to go for a moisture that is, you know, in the Goldilocks zone. So let's take a look at this bin and see if I'm getting anywhere with the worms getting out. Last time that we looked on the bin, this portion over here was not, it wasn't drying out, but then again, we also had a ton of worms. So looking at it right now, there are less worms at this end. The moisture is still pretty high, but we're getting less worms. So I'm gonna call that progress. I'm just picking out the big chunks. I'm gonna put them in the feeding end of the bin. But looking at this here, we're all good. Got all kinds of uh, springtails in here and cocoons. I'm trying to find one I can Usually the European Nightcrawler cocoons are big enough that you can see on the camera. But of course I can't find one at this particular second. It seems like when you're not looking for them, they're everywhere. And then when you want to look and show people on the camera, then there's none to be found. Camera shy babies. So digging deep into this here, you can see where this is very, very damp. And so I'm getting air in here and trying to make sure that the moisture is homogenous so that hopefully the next time we come in here, I'll be able to get a bit of a harvest. Again, right now it is still way too wet to sift or anything. And you don't have to sift if you don't want to, but like I've showed in some of my more recent videos, I do sift so that I can uh, put these on my bonsais. And I, I don't want any sort of you know tomato plant or pepper plant or weeds growing in there. I try and make them as, as clean as possible when I'm putting them directly in the bonsai uh, pots. If you wanted to go look at that, that was, you know, probably the last video that I did. I think that was the Red Wigglers or maybe the African Nightcrawlers. I'll link it above. So I'm just getting air in here and moving it along. Now I'm not seeing a bloom of bugs anywhere in here. But if you do, it's because they're needed. So if you just look at the bin as kind of like an ecosystem, and when there's a lot of super hard, tough food to eat, then you're gonna need the critters that are shredders. 
Worms are not shredders. They're more of a sopper upper with a spoon or a, you know, a straw kind of critters. I mean, they can nibble on things a little bit with their mouths, but they're not going to eat the tough stuff by themselves. Something is going to have to break it down for them. So when we're looking at that, a lot of people will have these hard foods in there and even things that maybe aren't hard, but are just not something the worms can get at. So you're going to need the bin critters to do it. I'm getting distracted by the worm ball. Um, tiny baby worms, medium sized worms, and adult worms, all right there. And they are very tiny, you are right, for European night crawlers. Now, this is the first time I've seen a avocado worm ball inside of the pit. That's pretty cool. Look at that. Interesting. Somebody else called them avocados. I like that. If you have any other worm words, put those in the comments below. I find that, I mean, we've got our own little language going on here in our vermiculture community. I don't know if I'm just a dork or whatever, but I enjoy hearing what other people use for worm words. Right, let me flip you around to the feeding end of the bin and we'll continue to talk about bugs. Okay, so when you get bugs in a bin, it is because basically they're needed. They're, except for flies and gnats, and those kind of bugs you do need to manage. But when we're talking about bugs similar to springtails and mites and isopods, you don't need to manage them. Ooh, this is gonna be a nice, like, concentration, almost like a worm ball. Look at that. Woohoo, good worms. So when you have something super tough in a bin, you know, like a corn, cob here or anything like that, the worms aren't going to take care of that all on their own. They're going to need some help. And when you start seeing the mites or these, I don't know if I'm going to be able to get close enough to see this, but there are these little tiny, tiny white worms. Those are uh, pot worms. So when you see these things show up, it's because they've been taken off the bench and they are being put into action and they have something of a, a population bloom. So it's just like everything in nature. When it's needed, you get a whole bunch of them. And then when there's no more food for them to work on, then they kind of die off and go dormant. So the same thing happens, you know, on the big populations when you're looking at like Yellowstone and you have a whole bunch of rabbits and elk and things like that. The wolf population goes crazy. And then when there's no more things to eat, then the wolf population declines. If you look at that, that's what's happening in here with the mites and the springtails, only kind of on a vegetarian level for the most part. So when you get a lot of things that need to be shredded up, you're going to get the shredder bugs in great populations. And although we might think they're creepy, they're useful for the bin. Then when you're looking at a newer bin and you're like, oh, I don't have all these things. And you're like, yay, I don't have bugs. But actually it's boo, you do, you need the bugs. So anybody um, who is, is actively trying to get rid of mites and springtails and isopods, you might wanna think about that. You might wanna not do that because honestly, they're useful and your worm bin is better off for them. And I know a lot of people, if they get in excess, but the way that nature takes care of things that are in excess is to bring in a predator of some sort. So you might see a different kind of mite, like you see all those little tiny white mites, if you look at my microscope videos, you know, once those get overpopulated, then all of a sudden the, the mites that eat the other mites show up. And when those are gone, then everything dies off until the next time that you have a type of food that requires that much help again, and then the cycle comes back again. All right, let's get these guys some food. Stack this up a little bit higher. So it's nice that all the worms are coming out of the, bit, the finished end. Maybe I'll get a bit of a harvest next time. Scoot this stuff down, make room for the new bedding and the new food. So kind of as a sidebar, I just wanted to talk to you about coconut coir. Not all coconut coir is the same. I purchased some that was on sale and I had to rinse it four times for it to run, run clear. The um, whatever was in the coconut coir smelled kind of funny. 
I rinsed it until it was clear and it smelled normal again, but sometimes when things are a good deal, they're not really a good deal. You get what you pay for. Uh, I have a link below to the kind that I've never had a problem with. Uh, it's the Mother Earth brand. Uh, like I said, I go and do it too. If something's cheap, I'm like, yay, sweet, cheap coconut coir. And then I end up spending an hour rinsing it to get rid of the salt and God knows what. I digress. Let's get them some food. Okay, so they're going to get some tomato. Another piece of avocado. Some cabbage. More tomato. And then in the back of my cabinet, I found some of these. And it's really fine stuff, so I don't think I have to puree it. Hopefully the worms will just eat it as is. Now, this is the first time I've put cocoa wheats in a worm bin, so uh, everybody fingers crossed with that. But of course, if they don't like it, the other bin critters will help them out until it is capable of being eaten. Let me get them a little bit more bedding. Part of the way that you keep the fly insects out of your bin is by having a nice layer of bedding on top of the food so that the flying critters don't smell it as they go by and then you don't end up with a gnat apocalypse as you've probably seen on this channel more than once. All right, let's go look at that new bin that this is the two month anniversary of that bin being started. Okay, here we are at the new European night crawlers and this bin is two months old now. And one of the things that I think a lot of people talk about is population. How can I get more worms? Or what do I do when I get so many worms? Worms are self-limiting. So if there's not enough food and there's not enough space, they're going to become smaller worms. And they're also going to slow down their breeding. And that's what happens in most of my bins. But not this one. This one is a new bin. We've got lots of open area here and not a whole bunch of worms. This has half the population or less than half the population of that bin we just looked at. And so these worms are gonna be able to grow and grow and grow and multiply because they've got so much room and the food is not split amongst so many individuals. All right, let's take a look at the older end, which is right over here. All right, so let me pull this back. This is kind of dry here. And, you know, with the moisture, like I said, uh, finished castings are very sticky and they hold moisture very, very well. New bedding uh, does not. So that's why you'll often see a moisture difference from new to old. Yep, this is still very, very crumbly and not sticky. Whereas you saw the other bin I was working on was actually pretty sticky. This one is not sticky. It's still very new bedding that they have not completely finished up yet. But it still smells very clean, like a forest floor. But we are gonna add some moisture today in the way of wet bedding. So looking at populations, so you've got people who breed worms for a living, like the new soil people that sent me these beautiful European Nightcrawler breeders. You know they're breeders because of this clitellum right here. It's a raised part that is a different color and also poofs up a little bit on the body. Now, when these, mm -mm. in order to keep the worms that big, if I wanted them to stay that big, I would really have to give them a lot of worm chow and I would have to give them quite a bit of bedding that is very rich. Um, Amazon boxes are not very rich. Although I do add some uh, fish meal and kelp meal to my bedding, it's still not very rich. Um, I think leaves, I'm going to try and do a better job of, of getting more leaves this year because those are a little bit more nutrient rich than just yield cardboard boxes because that is what I use most of the time. And that is why my worms are actually very small for the most part. But I don't care about that really so much. I'm just trying to get them to eat my garbage. Uh, I don't fish that much anymore. So it's really not a problem that my worms aren't big and huge. But if you do want big, huge worms, you're going to have to work a little harder and you're not going to be able to go a month between feedings. You're going to have to come in here every week or twice a week to feed your worms to make sure that they are bulking up. All right, let's flip you around and look at the feeding end of the bin. Okay, so I've moved all the dry bedding down here, and it is dry. 
Let's look and see what we've got left over from the food. I think there were some avocados, some tomatoes last time. I probably have a mouse in the basement because this has been a little bit disturbed. But tis the season. They're, they've started harvesting things and you know everybody's got to live someplace, right? Here's a little bit of a worm ball here. And, oh, that's that potato. If you don't cover those up really well with bedding, um, potatoes will stink terribly as they break down. Uh, this one doesn't smell bad because all the bin critters have eaten all of the stuff that would smell terrible. And that's why you bury it really, really well. One, so you don't encourage pests, and also so you don't smell it yourself. My stuff's in the basement here, so I'm not likely to smell it up on the people end of my building. But you can tell the breeders have been breeding, and we have lots of babies in here. So they are doing their job, and the population of this bin will eventually, in the next 3, 6, 9, 12 months, will get to the point where it would fill this entire bin, at which point things will start to slow down. The new worms, like this one here, this one was probably born in this bin, and you can see how much smaller it is from that monster a little bit ago. And that's because that's the size my worms are, because I only feed them once a month, and I don't feed them chow that often. So if your goal is bigger, bigger worms, then you are going to have to spend a lot more time making them bigger. Okay, so let me get these guys some food. All right, so these worms, or this bed, seems to be quite a bit drier, and it also has some of that bedding that has definitely dried out down here. So gonna make sure that is a really wet feeding so that will soak into all that bedding and be very, very good. Then I'm gonna get them the rest of their moist bedding that's been prepared that has shredded cardboard, coconut coir, and it also has um, kelp meal and fish meal in it. Okay. So if you're trying to control the moisture to make things more wet, then you're going to want to add wet things. And in the event that your bin gets way too wet, then you're going to want to add dry cardboard or dry coconut coir to soak up the extra moisture so that your bin doesn't get anaerobic. And since this bin is super new, I am going to give them a ton of bedding to kind of bulk it up so that those new worms that have been breeding have lots of room to spread out with their babies. All right, guys, well, if you like the European night crawlers, I have this playlist that I will put right over here. And if you've already seen that, YouTube thinks this one over here is the one you should watch next. All right, guys, thanks for hanging out with me and my worms and everybody. Have a good day.